Hey, let's talk about a video game. Dragon's Crown was released in the summer of 2013 for the PlayStation 3 and PS Vita. Immediately upon its release, it was hit with intense backlash due to the supposedly over-sexualized designs of its characters, focused specifically on the immense size of a particular character's breasts. Well, you know what I had to do. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 was released in the winter of 2017 for the Nintendo Switch. Immediately upon its release, it was hit with intense backlash due to the supposedly over-sexualized designs of its characters, focused specifically on the immense size of a particular character's breasts. Well, you know what I had to do. Hey, you know what game I love? Dragon's Crown. Hey, you know what game I love? Chrono Trick. Hey, you know what game I love? Xenoblade Chronicles 2 was released in the winter of 2017 for the Nintendo Switch. It's a JRPG with some light gotcha elements. Throughout the game, your cast of characters will fluctuate, with some characters being a major part of the story and other side characters being random characters that an individual player may encounter or may never see on any individual playthrough, depending on a roll of the dice. If you haven't touched this game at all, I hope my brief explanation of the story and mechanics will help set context for what I'm going to talk about with this game. If you have, you probably already know all this stuff, but just hang tight. The primary characters in this game are called drivers. Any driver may be attached to a secondary character called a blade. The driver uses the blade as a weapon, a vector to cast magic spells and do various team attacks. The characters work in tandem with a few drivers the player can swap between, and those drivers having a larger number of custom blades they can swap between during the course of the story. Some of the blade characters are plot relevant. Some are randomly accessed through the game's gotcha mechanics. The gotcha uses an in-game currency rather than real money, but it has an impact on your experience nonetheless. The blade characters have a few interesting features. Because in the fiction of the world, they are beings of pure magic or artificial life forms, they don't have to obey the rules of nature where it comes to their designs. With the lore supporting this, they can be wildly impractical in their costume choices as a result. These character concepts were not all designed by the core Xenoblade Chronicles team. A number of different guest, manga, and game artists chipped in and created concepts for the game. Blade designs vary wildly and go in a lot of different directions. But one factor is common among many of the Blade designs, Hot girls. See, hot girls are fun to draw. Hey, uh, by the way, there's going to be spoilers for this game in this essay about some mid-game revelations and some of the content found in side stories. I tend to use spoilers to examine and entice rather than just summarize. But if having some clips from the game's cutscenes is going to bother you, maybe don't watch the rest of this until you've played it. Later on in this video, I do a pretty deep dive on a couple main characters and their personal stories, and I don't know how much that's going to bother you and your personal tolerance for spoilers. So that's my heads up. Spoiler warning from here on out. Once upon a time, a friend linked me to a video essay about the sexualization in this game and why it was controversial. I'm going to link an example of that, although I've seen it commented on in a lot of different places. So this video makes some good points and some points that I don't agree with. My video essay is not a rebuttal to these older essays. It's just that, like, I'm an academic and I've been theorizing about video games for decades. I, time flies. And I love Xenoblade Chronicles 2. As you might know from my other work, I also love anime boobs. When I was younger and still figuring out my body, I felt a little unsure of myself. Characters like Lara Croft, the queen of the action game, could be kind of off-putting. Not just because their design was over the top, the breasts, they were large, but also the marketing around them leaned into the male gaze and really objectified the characters. I mean, let's face it, early aughts game marketing was kind of rough and cringe. It put out a vibe that video games were a no girls allowed club. In Tomb Raider adds, there was a lot less focus on Lara Croft as a person or a character and a lot of focus on Lara Croft as an ass in the shower. And that really colored my opinion of her. And early on, I was kind of a hater. I'm over it. Now that I'm adult and realize the body I have in this world, I actually kind of like this character design. Some of it is just that we as a society have made some progress in understanding that the audience for video games isn't just horny teenage boys. And some of it is the acknowledgement that, you know, Boobs are pretty darn good. 
I have posted other videos dissecting the topic of anime boobies in more detail, so I'm not going to take this time into the artistic purpose of anime breast physics. Instead, I'm going to talk about, like, the emotional resonance of the boobs. Because, yeah, I occasionally will confess the enormous size of Pyra's Anka-danka-badankas comically undercut otherwise emotional moments in the story. But generally speaking, you should look past it. Pay attention. Her eyes are up here. This isn't to say you're a bad, wrong person for being uncomfortable with this kind of character design. Nobody can control what makes them uncomfortable. But instead of just slamming down your gavel and saying, Boobs! Bad! You probably should examine your reactions about this topic in a little more depth. Because, you know, boobs are a body part. It's reductive to say something like, In character design, large breasts means the character is more of a sex pot. Therefore, she can't have any other aspects to her personality because that's the signal that this body part, which is otherwise just a body part, is somehow sending. Because that kind of sucks. If girls who happen to be drawn this way are constantly told that they can't be the main character and heroine because the very design of their actual bodies isn't somehow practical, it really sends a rough message to people who might already be struggling with body image issues. As someone who was built more like Brigid, it's exhausting to constantly hear that Morag is the good character design because she's covered up and she's modest and she's small chested and that, that is feminism. That if female characters don't dress to hide their shape and don't have visible busts, they're just being practical and realistic and that's the only design aesthetic that's actually feminist. Hey, I have nothing against Morag. I like Morag. Morag is really cool. I also like Brigid. And I like them, uh, together. Okay, guys, now it's time for a special lightning round. Today I'm running around New York with a pack of wild lesbians. They're going to chase after people with me and help them answer questions. Let's go. Let's go, lesbians. Let's go. Let's go. Here we go. Rounding the corner with a bunch of lesbians! Here we are, Manhattan! Can you handle it? I'm gonna try not to lose the plot here, but I just want to gush a little bit about Brigid and Morag. As a couple? As a thing? I'm just like... Okay, let me try again. Morag and Brigid are in a lesbian-coded relationship, but the power dynamic is uneven in a fascinating way. Morag, the Imperial Inquisitor is technically the person in charge in this relationship. She's the human driver who controls Brigitte, the blade, using her as a weapon in combat. Blades are literally objects in some ways. Their essence is stored to weapons the wielder can utilize when they call upon their combat spirit. Blades, unlike drivers, are immortal. And like an heirloom weapon, they are passed from wielder to wielder without much control over their own destiny. But even so, is Morag really the one uh, wearing the pants? Brigid is one of the most powerful blades in the kingdom, an ancient servant of the Empire whose feats in battle under previous drivers designed the future of this kingdom. She has a diary she keeps about her past exploits so she won't forget everything she's done, and the diary entries of all her great deeds go back for centuries. Morag might be the boss, but Brigid has the power. It's a super romantic push-pull. It would be easy to reduce this relationship to the bush one and the femme one, that's a read you can have on these two as a couple as far as their character designs go. But if you look deeper into the characters than just the first impressions you get from their visual designs, you'll learn that Morag isn't exactly rejecting feminine presentation. Pandoria, a bashful blade who has a story arc of her own, at one point asks Morag for some advice on her hair and skincare routine. It's recognized that Morag is really pretty and takes good care of herself. Morag just simply has her own set of style that occasionally rejects typical gender norms. It's practical, but that's not the only strength that we can use to measure a character's design. And yeah, before you get salty and correct me in the comments, Tora, another character in the game, does mistake Morag for a man because of her clothing alone. But we'll get back to Tora later. Brigid also takes good care of herself. And Brigid and Morag, the two of them, seem to take good care of each other? <laughs> uh, I'm trying to do better than just 
staring at two hot girls talking about rubbing lotion on each other because this is a story with stakes and the characters have real pathos and drama. In some ways, I know I can get away with this kind of objectification because I'm a woman looking at other women. Hey, Morak, how about next time you put on a skirt and some heels? How about you die in a fire, Zeke? So let's just talk about... So I said male gaze before when I was talking about Laura Croft. So what is the male gaze? The male gaze in feminist theory is the assumption that in cinema or other media that resembles cinema, a female character is there to be looked upon by the camera, which takes an active male role in examining the character. So when a camera lingers on, say, the bust or buttocks of a woman, this is the male gaze objectifying the female character for presumed male audience. With that in mind, what about the female gaze? Is that even a thing? Now, here I'm going to discuss the female gaze as it pertains to the interest of male attracted women. So bear with me, it does exist. But people don't seem to understand the female gaze when they see it. This is partially because of its relative rarity compared to the straight male gaze. Since the viewer of a work is so often presumed to be a man by default, men conflate the straight female gaze with a gay male gaze, then they might project homosexuality onto the male character in question. Stop me if you've seen that one before. In Xenoblade Chronicles, I can't think of a better example than Gorg. Gorg is an optional character who you may or may not encounter in the course of your playthrough of the game. Gorg was designed by character artist and writer Soraya Saga, who was also the designer for Edgar and Sabin in Final Fantasy VI. Gorg is a sexy, shirtless fish man. He's a fairly strong combatant, but if you dig into his personality a little bit, he does not dream of martial prowess. He dreams of opening a bakery. That's right, girls! Not only is there a sexy, shirtless fish man, but this sexy, shirtless fish man wants nothing more out of his life than to bake you, yes you, a cherry cheesecake. We already know how much women love a hot fish man and... Oh no! Oh no! Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. Intel has told us there were at least seven. Look, I already see one given. Okay. They're the same picture. Gorg is the most designed by a woman thing I've seen in a video game since Bayonetta. Oh, hey, I got this far into the essay and didn't even talk about Dahlia, the character that launched a thousand think pieces. Let's check in with Dahlia. Many people accuse Xenoblade Chronicles 2 with blatantly catering to the male gaze with this design. The soft eyes, the huge boobs, the exaggerated bend of her spine. Well, wait, hang on a second. Thalia, just like Gorg, was also designed by a woman. Her character artist was designer and former erotic manga illustrator Risa Ibata. Also, it's worth pointing out that, like Gorg, Dahlia is an optional character. You may never recruit her in any given playthrough of the game. Even if you do, actually engaging with her story is optional. So Dahlia. She's Dolly Parton. Her name is Dolly Uh, and she talks like a southern belle, and she has big ol' boobies, and she takes care of the children. The joke is that she's Dolly Parton. It feels like a lot of people miss this. I do not know why. Dolly Parton herself once famously said that her personal look was inspired by the town tramp. The town tramp in my hometown when I was a little girl. This woman that used to walk the streets had all this makeup and hair, high heel shoes. And I thought she was so beautiful. And everybody used to say, oh, she ain't nothing but trash. And I used to say, well, that's what I'm going to be when I grow up, trash. And that's kind of how I look. But I like to think I'm a little more than that. And do you think maybe, like, maybe there's actually really honestly an element of feminine power fantasy and not just male gaze in embodying a character like this? Not for all of us, but you know, for some of us. Do you think we can square Dahlia's design with Dolly Parton's comments and with other experiences that women have had with their own gender performance and how you might want to possibly yourself be embodied in the persona of a big tittied sexy rabbit woman? Uh, I wouldn't know, man. I'm too busy playing a half-naked Viera in Final Fantasy XIV. Oh, so I dropped another big bomb there. 
While we're talking about how Dolly Parton chooses to present herself, let's talk about gender performance. At the end of the day, gender performance is what this entire video essay is kind of about. So this part is gonna get a little academic. Well, that could be boring, so I won't make this super long. Maybe you've heard before of the concept of gender performance. This term was first used in an essay by feminist theorist Judith Butler in the late 80s. The idea here is that gender and sex are not quite the same thing. Gender is socially constructed and it's partially created by the expectations of others. If you're performing gender, you are essentially leaning into these expectations, acting the way a man or woman is supposed to act. In this way, gender isn't just a thing you are, but it's also an act that you do. And you can work pretty hard at it if you try. It's not necessarily something you're forced to do. Feminine gender performance can be fun. And if you don't believe me, just rewind that bit from Dolly Parton and watch it again. But other times, people are performing gender just to fit in because they think that's what other people expect of them. And that brings me to the blushy crushy. The most important thing for me is, um, oh, knock on wood, is uh, blushy crushy. This is an optional but deeply critical cutscene in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. On the surface, this cutscene is stupid. It's a side scene in the game, and the sound mixing in it is sort of bad. It's completely optional and is not required to beat the overall story. It's one of the most interesting cutscenes I've ever seen in a video game, and it just gave me a lot to think about regarding the act of gender performance. Okay, major spoilers. So Pyra, as we come to discover throughout the story, is a fake person. Kind of. Pyra was originally Mithra, the Aegis, a blade of immeasurable power. Mithra was a warrior first, and though she obviously cuts quite an attractive figure, she's also a little rude and pushy. She's got some Sundari tendencies. She's a notoriously bad cook. She's blunt with her emotions, has no idea how to flirt, and doesn't really like to be told what to do despite being a weapon to be used. Pain in Mithra's past was too hard to bear. She decided at some point she needed not only to try harder to be kind, but to lock away her memories of what she once was. She needed to be gentler, more demure. She needed to be better in the kitchen. She just flat out needed to be a different person who she thought was better. So she invented that person and that person became Pyra. In other words, Pyra is what you get when you start out as Mithra and then perform femininity as hard as you possibly can. And yet, in this scene, the blushy crushy, we hear from Tora. Tora is a pervert. This nopon, that's his race, comes from a long line of anime maid enjoyers. Tora's family has created increasingly elaborate robot maids, becoming artificial drivers who create robot women to serve them completely. It's a little weird. It's a little problematic. And by the way, y'all, it's okay for a protagonist in fictional series to do problematic things. Tora kind of sucks, but he's still in the story. And his robot maid Poppy is also in the story, struggling with her own demons about being created as eye candy housemaid for a weirdo. In this cutscene, Tora complains that Poppy as his own creation, who he invented to be the perfect woman, is clearly better at woman stuff than Pyra is. Pyra needs to blush more, bend over more, try a little harder to please all the men around her. We've already established that Pyra is what Mithra decides to become when she tries to perform femininity as hard as she possibly can. But it's not enough for Tora. She's not doing it hard enough. She needs to be even girlier, even harder. I feel like there's a strong parallel between this and the monologue that America Farrar delivers in the Barbie movie about how no matter how hard you're trying to be a woman, you're probably not doing it right enough to please everybody. It was relatable to hear those words in a major motion picture, but I feel like I'd somehow already gotten some of this education because I was enlightened by the lesson of the blushy crushy. Now, I won't spoil everything that happens in the story, but at some point, as Pyra and Mithra's driver, Rex, you get to choose. Would you prefer for Pyra to front most of the time? Or does Mithra feel more real to you? There's a part in the story where Mithra straight up asks Rex, You'd rather I was her? As if she's jealous of her other counterpart, 
a counterpart she invented and then made manifest for the comfort of men. And I'm not going to judge you if you choose Pyra as your favorite, since Pyra, at this point in the story, has become a valid person in her own right. After all, we are what we pretend to be. Which is why I am, in fact, an ancient vampire on the internet. So look, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 did a thing where the game did an immense amount of world building to justify these over-the-top character designs. They let the designers go hog wild, and the fictional scaffolding was created to support the concepts of, like, hot anime babes who turn into super weapons who love you. In discussing the themes of queerness and gender and feminism throughout this game, I'm not trying to make some disingenuous argument that because it's justified in fiction, there's no objectification happening ever. Like, you could look back at this entire essay and say, okay, but everything you've said here is kind of BS because sometimes artists just want to draw hot girls and they'll write a story around there being hot girls in it. And like, yeah, I agree. Saying everything is justified in universe by some fictional contortion is kind of a bad argument. It leads you to authors who are a little dishonest about why they really made their decisions about character design. And making up these justifications when you really just wanted to like look at a butt is kind of embarrassing for everybody involved. But I do think that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 wrote some really interesting fiction about what happens in a world where anime is real, how it impacts the people in the universe who are literally written as tools and objects and have to cope with their own objectification. And I think it's a game with a lot of strong romantic themes that are fun to explore. You're gonna lose sight of that if all you think is, oh, that's the Nintendo game with the huge tits, right? Cover that up. Hey, thanks for watching. This is my first major video essay. If you like it, it'd be great if you left a comment below, hit like, or otherwise engaged with the algorithm so that I can keep making more content like this. You might like checking out some of my Twitch VODs too. Follow the channel and at some point, I'll do another video sharing my personal recipe for Pyra Sunshine Pie.